Who is the king of crazy? Is it Anton Chigurh, a hitman incapable of empathy in no country for old men? Is it Lou Bloom, a poor nobody willing to go to any lengths for the great American dream in Nightcrawler? Is it Annie Wilkes, a lonely obsessive superfan of a book series in Misery? Or is it Annie Wilkes, an overly protective mother on the run with her daughter in Castle Rock? Wait, what? Yeah, so Castle Rock is a sort of anthology horror series set in Stephen King's fictional town in Maine, featuring many elements from his many books. And while the show itself may not be anything to write home about, what definitely is, is the central character of season 2, Annie Wilkes. Annie Wilkes, who you know from Misery, where she's a number one fan of a book series that she doesn't want the author to end. I don't want her In Castle Rock, though, she's not that yet. Instead, she's a mother on the run with her daughter, Joy. For years and years, they've moved from one town to the next with the same plan. She gets a temp job as a nurse, she steals some pills she needs, and then it's on to the next town. Until they come across Castle Rock. There, they get stuck, and then, in the usual Stephen King manner, shady supernatural things begin to happen, which threaten to break them apart forever. And if you wonder why I'm telling you all this, hold up, wait a minute, something ain't right. It's because, as I mentioned in a video before, Annie Wilkes in Castle Rock is one of the greatest characters I've seen in a long time. And in this video, I want to share her story with you, not only so that you can experience it, but also so that you can understand why she's so great and how to use those qualities in your own characters. Since, sadly, I can't really recommend the show itself. There's a lot of stuff here not about Annie, and I doubt many of you want to sit through it. Amity returns at sunset, and when the prophet returns to us tonight... You can give season 2 a chance, but for those who won't, I don't want this gold the buried deep within his mine to go to waste. All right, lads, time to dig out the treasure. To be clear, as always, there are many great qualities about Annie as a character. For example, much like Lou Bloom, she's very specifically written. The way she carries herself, the way she's always helplessly exasperated as if the world is out to get her, the way she's polite in words, but not so much in demeanor. Her OCD, paranoia, her obsession with getting her pills, her adamance to protect her daughter Joy at any cost. I haven't been out the house in a week. Little love, this town is not a good place. Oh, and the way she sees monsters. It's all as a whole, the best way to describe Annie is that she's a tiger in a circus, a cobra in a Christmas sock. She's this seemingly harmless, out of place thing you think you can get close to, but the moment you do, it's game over. And credit also to the actor Lizzie Kaplan, who's simply incredible, my favorite actor to watch right now. She keeps being in these mediocre shows and absolutely shining nonetheless. But all that said, the most impressive aspect about Annie in Castle Rock that makes her a 10 out of 10 character like the likes of Lou Bloom is her insanity. See, crazy in cinema is kinda cool, all writers wanna do it. The problem is that most writers don't know how. How do you do, fellow insanity writers? What? They make the mistake of thinking that insanity is simple. Oh, this one bad thing happened to my character and now they're crazy. Now they do crazy things like destroy the universe. We'll burn them out of time for what they've done to me. Shut your fuck! No. Whereas in reality, the human mind is so much more complex. It takes so much more for mental illness to develop and function authentically. And that is the second season of Castle Rock. It's basically two origin stories for Annie Wilkes' messed up head. There's a whole very excellent backstory episode explaining how she became this cuckoo clock she is in the show. And on top of that, the show itself is also a story of how the scorpions of her mind transform her from this overprotective mother into this obsessive superfan of a book series that she doesn't even know exists before the climax. And again, in this video, spoilers ahead, I wanna share that story with all of you who won't otherwise experience it. 
So let's do it. Let's first go through the backstory episode chronicling Annie's descent into madness to learn a valuable writing lesson of how insanity is born in a believable way. And then let's see how Annie's mental issues take her to an ending that despite its sheer insanity makes total sense, as well as how you need to view your character's craziness for it to function in an authentic manner. Here is Annie Wilkes's crazy story and the two crazy lessons to learn from it. To kick things off, there's the backstory episode chronicling young Annie's descent into madness. The lesson of which is that this descent is not a single waterfall, but rather a series of ever-increasing cascades leading to a drop there's no climbing back up from. And this episode is a great example of what those cascades can be. The first cascade here is a baseline of everything not being all right. Lil Annie has some serious trouble with reading, which gets her bullied and ostracized at school. And she also has unfiltered bipolar tendencies in her words, it's not working. as well as her actions. <laughs> which is very useful in a writing sense because it gives you a foundation to build on. The next cascade is a strong set of influences affecting and molding Annie. Her dad, for example, is a man of quite strong opinions. He's not on board with the progressive nature of Annie's school. Politically correct, I think, is the term. It's touchy feely propaganda. Oh, and she's, she's bored. He doesn't believe in modern medical science. Hopeful new medication. All of you people, you, 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 you're foisting chemicals onto children. In fact, he's so convinced that he's right that he pulls Annie from the school system and teaches her to read himself by making her type out the book he's working on as an aspiring author. And the mom's not too mellow either. She sees things as black and white. She believes that the world is a dirty place where those in power aim to take advantage of those less fortunate who will be content with the scraps they're given. At GED, you get it and you get out of this place. She believes that there are only good people and bad people and that those people deserve a fate in accordance. All of which is also narratively useful because the fact that Annie is influenced by strong beliefs and opinions allows her to have strong beliefs and opinions as well. The Pinocchio's a liar. So why should he get a happy ending? In this world, you're either good or you're bad. And, and if you're bad, you pay. Annie, did your mom tell you that? Yes. The third cascade is that not everything's terrible. Much like in real life, there are good things in Annie's life. Positives that keep her going, aspirations that give her a direction to go. The fact that her dad teaches her makes them very close. He's her best friend. They have great times. She ultimately gets a professional teacher to prepare for a high school diploma test. I'm Rita. And after some initial friction, they become close as well. They fit well together. They make great progress. They become Become inseparable for the year or so that they work together. For the first time, Annie has made a real friend outside her family. She's even looking forward to seeing this baby that Rita's cooking. Where's her daddy? It's, um, it's complicated. No, it isn't. Everything is looking more and more up. Annie passes the test and gets her diploma. She gets excited about going to college. There's a lot of positive motion she's moving with. But then comes the next cascade, which is corruption of that positive motion and its direction. Something goes wrong between Annie's parents, which forces her dad to move out, at least for now. And even though Annie is still excited to go to the same college as her dad and maybe even be a writer like her dad, they even have creative writing classes. The mom is not too excited because of those same beliefs from before. Oh, you'll pass. You'll pass and pass. That'll be enough. Who wants you close and low to the ground so they can snatch what they want whenever they want it. Just like your father did to me when I was barely a woman. She thinks that the deadbeat dad has got Annie, that he has brainwashed and trapped her into a life of scraps just as he did with her, and that there is only one way to save Annie from this dirty world. Commit double self bye-bye. <laughs> And although Annie survives physically, not so much spiritually, because now all those hopes and dreams propelling her forward have been corrupted and contaminated. 
she can't bring herself to even apply to college now, which means that all that work seems to have been for nothing. She suddenly can't do anything with these positives giving her life purpose. She can just sit around the house while her dad tries to keep things together. It's like she has this V8 engine driving her forward but with no direction to go, like she's being squeezed against a brick wall, which does pretty bad things to a human. And then comes the next cascade, which is complete destruction of all the good. Annie gets a ray of hope when Rita shows up to visit with her baby, but pretty soon it becomes clear that she's not just visiting, that something's up between Rita and Annie's dad that puts pieces into place in terms of why her dad had to leave and what happened to her mom. Lots to take in, right? You're her daddy too? And the river was only six months ago. Reading was my problem, not math. Yeah, turns out that despite their initial animosity, Rita and Annie's dad ultimately bonded via their common interests in literature and this baby is the result. As in, Annie's two best and only friends betrayed her for each other in a way that made her lose it all. Her family, her mother, her direction. It's like the very reasons of her existence have turned on her to become the opposite and it keeps getting worse. Rita moves in, so Annie will have to let the baby take her room and get out the way. <laughs> now that Rita is in, she's like a parasite. She gets all the dad's attention that he used to give to Annie. Quick toast to Rita. Rita! And after a decade of working on her dad's book with him to get it ready and published, Annie finds out that he dedicated it to the parasite. For Rita K. Green, my laughing place. And now comes the final and most crucial cascade, which is Event Horizon, the drop from which there's no returning even if you wanted to. Annie confronts her dad about the dedication and because of those bipolar tendencies from the baseline, she accidentally goes too far. Rita is your laughing place. You can have more than one. Come here. And at this point, everything Annie once had is gone, all because of this bad parasite. There is a more reasonable action to take, which is to call an ambulance or something, but in Annie's mind, there's really only one choice remaining. <laughs> Yeah, Annie steals the baby and following her mom's teachings, she aims to rescue herself and the baby from this dirty world by not letting the world have them. We first to both get away clean. It's an insane thing to do and yet you don't question any of it. You have no doubt that what you're watching is a real person behaving like a real person. It's just that thanks to those many cascades piling on top of each other, there's no other way left for this person to behave. Will Annie go through with it? Find out after these less depressing intermission messages. <laughs> you want to be happy? Then get a puppy. Call now. <laughs> you want to be happy but not have to worry about a puppy? Well, delight yourself or someone else with the perfect last minute Christmas gift. A gift that's needed and wanted by everyone, including global superstars like Lionel Messi. And that's Exter, the best wallet in the business that makes you wanna toss your messy old brick wallet down the drain. Do you want it back? No. A slim, minimalist design where your cards and cash are neatly organized and quickly accessible in a super cool way that makes you feel like a hero in a Tarantino movie premium leather or even a tougher quality material of your choice that not only lasts but also offers RFID protection to prevent your cards from being scanned from the outside. A small solar powered tracker to help you keep an eye on where your wallet is going and what it's up to. I think how drunk you are. Well, I'm not drunk. And what's best is that Exter is right now sponsoring an end of the year Filmento discount of up to 55% off with the link below using code Filmento. So definitely check them out and there you go. Everything's happy and great now. That's enough of that. No, 
Now that Annie has descended into madness, the next step is to ensure that she operates within that madness in an authentic way, which is done by always being able to see things rationally from her irrational perspective. As you can maybe guess, young Annie doesn't do what she was about to. Instead, she realizes that there's still innocence left in the baby and through that decides to go on the run with her, naming her Joy. All of which makes her obsessive insanity in the show make total sense. But I won't let them. It'll be blood on Christmas before I let them, Joy. I'll throw my blame body between you and Annie. <gasps> Like I mentioned, the basic character gist of Annie is that she's a stick of dynamite inside a birthday cake. You think you can get close, but the moment you do, the moment you even mention her daughter and danger in the same sentence, she blows up in your face, no matter if you're friend or foe. And what's clear now is that Annie's obsessively protective personality doesn't come only from her love of joy, but more so from the fact that her own existence is dependent on joy. With everything that happened, that was it for Annie. It was time for her to log herself off the game. But then she saw that, hey, I have this pure innocent thing now that I can protect from the dirty world. That's what I'm here for. That's what all that happened was for. Everything is fine as long as joy is fine. That's the basis of Annie's insanity and it's through that basis that her actions and transformation occur. Once Annie and Joy survive the events of Castle Rock, they travel to Canada to finally live their lives in peace. Except now, Annie has a problem, which is that Joy isn't being herself. She's distant and rebellious. I can get you some hair dye. Get it back to normal. I like it this way. She watches a French movie on TV. She's making these dark drawings. And there is a reasonable explanation. Joy grew up as a person during this experience. She watches a French movie because it's Montreal and that's what there is. She might have made those drawings while under the witch's spell in Castle Rock. Like there's definitely cause for uncertainty. And if you want to uncover the answer yourself, see the full show, because I will talk about the ending now. It's a verdict. It's incredibly tight, isn't it? Sadly, as we now understand, Annie can't see reason in that way. In her mind, the only way it makes sense that Joy isn't being her innocent little girl self is that the French witch in Castle Rock took over her body before she could save her. That the witch now lives among them what? in Joy's body. That the real Joy is trapped somewhere deep down to be used by this other person. That her purity has been soiled, just like Annie's mom always talked about. What? Who were you talking to? On the phone, you were talking to someone. Who were you talking to? I wasn't to? on the phone. And in accordance to those talks, in accordance to everything that happened, in accordance to Annie's existence being dependent on there being an innocent, pure joy to protect from the dirty world, there's just one reasonable thing Annie can do. Do not risk the witch getting away and to save joy by not letting this witch or this dirty world have her. Is there something? Did you put something in that? Haldol. What the fuck? Such dirty words. Not like my joy. My own sweet girl? And you didn't think I know that you were one of them? And then, turns out, and it was wrong. Turns out Joy was still Joy. She just wanted to get some space and live her own life for a change. Luckily though, it all turned out great in the end. Annie saved Joy just in time. What you fell in the water, you almost drowned. You saved me. And things are looking up again. Joy is back to being her usual innocent little girl self to the point where Annie doesn't even really have to worry about her anymore. Instead, she's found something else to obsess over. This series of books about a character called Misery. It's a book that Annie found when they left Castle Rock. She's been reading them religiously to herself and to Joy as they travel to Canada, much like she once read with her dad. Simply put, these books are the greatest, purest thing in this world she's seen. And when they go meet the author in a signing event, the final pieces fall in place. Turns out that when Annie saved Joy, she didn't do it in the way you and I would perceive saving Joy. She didn't resuscitate her body back to life. No, she saved Joy in a way that she believes 
Joy was saved. Is this seat taken? Of course it is, mister. <gasps> no. No, 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 no. What? Look. Oh, we have to get him to dedicate a book to you. Of course he will. I'm his number one fan. Don't take this the wrong way, but this is one of my favorite endings ever. Not because it makes you feel good, but because it's so effective in staying with you, because it makes the madness of Annie Wilkes' mind crystal clear and authentic. In the movie Misery, why does Annie hold the author of the books hostage and force him to write more instead of ending the character and the series? Because her own existence is tied to the existence of those books. I put two bullets in my gun, one for you, and one for me. Why does Annie do absolutely anything to keep Joy safe? Because Joy is the only way for her to rationalize her childhood tragedy and keep living. So they can use you and own you, but, but I won't let them. It'll be blood on... That's the most important lesson for writing insanity. Your character can't be just a crazy character doing crazy things. They must be the sanest person in the world the way they see it. You as the writer must be able to empathize with them, to view things the way they do and rationalize the irrationality. For Annie Wilkes' mind to rationalize her existence in this dirty world, she needs something pure to obsess over and protect. For the longest time it was joy, but she's not here anymore. There is no joy, there is only misery. And without joy, there must absolutely be misery. For Annie, there is no other option. Her insanity for her. Hmm. Good beginning. Is sane.